Good morning, it is Sunday, June 6th, 2021, and I am Pastor Mark Dilley of West Valley Grace Fellowship. I pray that the message this morning will be used to strengthen you in your faith and encourage you in your walk with our Savior and Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. And let's open our Bibles or follow along on the handout of we're going through the book of Galatians and we're coming to Galatians chapter 1 beginning with verse 13. Galatians 1 13. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from birth and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not consult any man, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went immediately into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Peter and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God, that what I am writing you is no lie. Later I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report, the man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we gather together today in the name of your Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We gather here filled with thanksgiving and awe for all that you have given us in him. This marvelous gospel of the grace of God that was committed to Paul's trust and has been kept by you and made known down through the ages and has come to us that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God in the flesh, died on the cross for our sins and that he bore them in his body, paying our punishment, that by faith in him we would receive the gift of eternal life in a future with you forever. And so our hearts are filled, Lord, with thanksgiving, and we desire to know you better, to worship you in spirit and in truth. And so we gather here this morning to be taught by your spirit through your word, what you would have us know and how you would have us live in this present evil world. And so, Lord, we look to you with confidence, knowing that you are working in every believer to will and to do of your good pleasure. And so we just simply trust in you, our faithful God, who is able to do all that he has promised. And it's in the name of your Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about the radical change and we identified some of the things that Paul was making known that were radically different than what the established religion of that day, the Hebrew religion, was preaching and believing. And so Paul says here now, as he's writing to these Galatians and probably focusing a little bit on the Jewish part of that fellowship. 
But anyway, he says in Galatians 1.13, For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism. If you remember when Paul was converted uh, and he tried to interact originally with other Jewish Messianic saints, they were rather hesitant. They were questioning if it might be some guise of Paul, some deception to, to get into their uh, inner groups and take them off to prison like that's what he was doing wherever he could find them. And so there was a lot of concern and so Paul's expressing here that was all true. That was before he had this radical change in his life. And so let's look at a couple of passages that talks about this. Philippians chapter 3 verses 4 through 6. And we'll actually start in Philippians 3 in the second half of verse 4. If anyone thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legal righteousness, faultless. And so that was Paul's resume as far as his religious attitude was. Again, this is where rightly dividing the word of truth becomes so critical. What was this church of God that Paul was trying to destroy and who were the members? The church of God that he is referring to was made up of all the Jews and proselytes who had believed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. And they had been baptized for the remission of sins. In other words, when the Lord Jesus Christ preached while he was here on earth, many people believed in him that he was the Messiah. In that message, there was no concept of the cross work of Christ. It was simply that I am the anointed one. I am the Messiah. I am the king. And if you believe that as a Jew, you were brought in to the kingdom family or the kingdom church. This assembly of people that now have trusted, has trusted Christ as their Messiah. And so that's who Paul was going after. Paul never persecuted the church, which is the body of Christ, because it never existed. That was all before the radical change, all the persecution Paul was doing. There were no believers in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There were no members of the church, the body of Christ at that time. And so the persecution he was doing was primarily against this small group of Jewish people who had believed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. And they made up a very small part of the nation of Israel. And so let's look at some other ones. Acts 22, verse 19 and 20. The Apostle Paul has been converted and uh, Paul is recounting this conversion experience and the things that happened afterwards. And so Paul is responding here to the Lord. And he says, Lord, I reply, these men know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Can you understand why the Jewish Messianic believers would be a little bit concerned about Paul? And so this is one of the 
amazing things about the Bible. The Bible is truth. And it simply declares truth. And a lot of times, we as people don't always want to accept what the Bible says. But the Word of God is the truth. It is truth. And then let's look at the next time, Acts 26, where Paul again is recounting his conversion and the things that followed. And he says here in Acts 26 and verse 9, I too was convinced, and that's an aorist active verb. He really <clears throat> believed in himself. It was already there. He knew what he believed. And he believed, and we'll go on to talk about that in a second, but he was sincerely thinking this was true. It was a sincere thought that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that's just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the saints in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. And I tried to force them to blaspheme. In my obsession against them, I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. And so Paul was totally sincerely believing he was doing what God ordained as far as this cult was concerned. That's how he viewed it. And uh, Here's where I need to make just a little bit of an apology because I'm going to go off script a little bit. Uh, invariably, every Sunday morning when I get up, I go back out and bring up my sermon and I rework it and change some wording and everything else. And the day when I did that, I got it all done and I hit the wrong button and it deleted the whole sermon. <laughs> and so there must have been something in there that God didn't want me to mention to you people today. But we're going to take a little diversion here for a second and take what was happening in Paul's life and where he was coming from and bring it up through history quickly, right up till the present day. And I think most of you are aware of the fact that Paul, even while he was still alive, people started to move away from this message that we so lovingly believe and embrace. Even in Paul's day, he says, all of Asia has forsaken me. No one stood by me. And so, even in his lifetime. And so, after Paul had passed off the scene, and by the time all the apostles had, been, had died, uh, traditionally, that I think they were all martyred except maybe John. But when all of that ended, there were writers that are called the church fathers and many of those men had known John I don't know if any of them had ever walked with Christ or anything but most of them knew the apostles and had interactions with them and their writings really don't include much about Paul's theology or Paul's teaching they had reverted back to Jesus Christ, the earthly Christ, in his ministry, his kingdom teaching. And then in, and again, my mind's fuzzy, but a man by the name of Constantine in Constantinople, uh, he made this sect called Christianity the religion of his realm. And that became recognized as the church and that group of people became more and more formalized in their doctrine and that became the Catholic Church in the Catholic Church much like and I don't say this with any malignant thought or any sense of um, shame or anything like that trying to point it at any religious position but the Catholic Church became much like Israel was 
they became the one that said, here's how you worship, here's what you can do. And it was divided up, they had their lay people that virtually had no say or anything to do with the decisions that were made. And then they had a hierarchy. I don't know back in those days, but today, or in my recent past, there were nuns and there were brothers, and then there were priests, and then there were bishops, and then there were archbishops, and then there were other hierarchy things until you got up to the Pope. Well, in the history of the Catholic Church, the Pope became the speaker. And I was raised in that theology for the first 33 years of my life. And I believed just like Paul. I believe that even if I was the worst Catholic in the world, I was better than the best Lutheran. I believe that if the Pope said something, it was just like God saying it. When he, and I, I don't know quite how to describe it, but apparently he sits in a chair someplace and gets direct communication from God, and then he speaks it. And so in the Catholic Church, and a lot of these things have varied over time, but as I recall it, anything that the Pope spoke under this authority was equally as valid as the word of God that's recorded in the Bible. And so therefore they have two rays of truth. One is papal tradition and the other one is the word of God. And they went so far as to say papal tradition takes priority. And so that's where the struggle came. And if you look at the bottom of your notes on the second page, there's a couple men we're going to talk about. Now this is just a couple of events where there are thousands of them. And this is what I had reworked quite a bit that got uh, deleted. And so we start out with a man by the name of John Wycliffe. And uh, this first sentence ended up at the end of his history, but it's here at the front. John Wycliffe died in 1384 from a stroke. Now, if you remember in the past, in my Bible, I have a quote from John Wycliffe. He was uh, recognized as the first man to translate the Bible into the language of the day. And uh, he said, it shall greatly help thee to understand the scriptures. And we go through about rightly dividing. Uh, well, that wasn't him that said that. Yeah, that was Cover Coverdale. But uh, Wycliffe was one that believed that the Bible should be in every farmer's hand. Plowboy. Plowboy, Plowboy right. And, uh, and so as a result, he was in pretty much conflict with the Catholic Church a lot about his views. Well, he, theologically, he had a strong predestination view. And so, uh, as it says here, it enabled him to believe in the invisible church of the elect. And we've talked about this concept in the past, about the fact that Paul calls the church the elect. And so, uh, Wycliffe believed that that was the true church. And it constituted those predestined to be saved rather than in the visible church of Rome. That is the organized institutional church of his day. And so uh, the Catholic church, he was probably one of the first uh, Martin Luther types. And they really didn't know what to do with him. So they just kept sort of moving him out of churches and getting him out of the limelight and everything else. He became a professor, I think, at the University of Oxford and was very well respected by a lot of people. And so the Catholic Church was hesitant to do anything to him. And so he ultimately died of a stroke in 1384. And then he was followed by a man by the name of John Huss, 
who was an adherent or one who embraced a lot of what Wycliffe was preaching. And Hus must have been a little more uh, abrasive and a little more aggressive. But one of his positions was that the church is not a hierarchy. It is the entire body of those who have been predestined for salvation. Christ, not the Pope, is its head. And so on June 5th, 1415, and prior to this, he, he'd been in a lot of trouble. They got him to come to a hearing. And so on June 5th, 1415, his trial began and he was moved to a Franciscan monastery. He, they, he was there for some, he was in prison for some time before his trial actually began. And then they moved him to this monastery. Uh, he'd been deprived food and sunlight and a lot of different things. He was probably in a pretty emaciated state by this time. And so anyway, uh, he declared himself willing to recant if his heirs should be proven to him from the Bible. In other words, he was willing to take back anything he said if they can show him in the Bible why he should do so. But otherwise, he defended his reformist position, protests against the church. The condemnation took place on July 6th, about a month later, in the presence of the assembly the council in the cathedral. After the high mass and liturgy, Huss was led into the church. He protested, and by the way, they didn't give him a chance to defend himself in this so-called trial. It's interesting, it's sort of like the trial of Christ when Israel crucified him. But anyway, he was led into the church. He protested that even at this hour, he did not wish anything but to be convinced from scripture. He fell upon his knees and asked God to forgive all his enemies. And so at the place of execution, he knelt down, spread out his hands and prayed aloud. The executioner undressed him, tied his hands behind his back, bound his neck with a chain to a stake around which wooden straw had been piled up so that it covered him to the neck. At the last moment, Hus refused to recant and thus save his own life. God is my witness that the things charged against me I never preached, Hus said. Now Paul says that in some of his writings that people are accusing him of things that he didn't do. In the same truth of the gospel which I have written, taught, and preached, Drawing upon the sayings and positions of the holy doctors, I am ready to die today. Well, they executed him, but it was interesting. Now they decided that letting Wycliffe be buried wasn't satisfactory. So now they dug up this man that had been buried for Sometime, I don't know if it's hundreds of years already, a couple hundred years maybe, close to that. But they dug him up and burned what was left. Now that's history. That's just, and if you go back in the inquisitions and things like that, there are estimates that the Catholic Church exterminated 30 million people. We think that the six million that got exterminated in Germany was so horrific. Now, I, don't, uh, I have no evidence if that 30 million people is accurate or not, but there's certainly much, much evidence in history about the persecution of the established church against those who stand strictly on the Bible. I've read many in fact, there's a book called uh, The Book of Martyrs, I think it is. I can't remember who wrote it. Maybe somebody knows. But uh, it's Fox. filled. Fox's Book of Martyrs. Yeah, Fox's Book of Martyrs. It's filled with evidence like this in all of these things. Uh, many of them saying, I will be faithful to the Pope. 
as long as the Pope is faithful to the Bible. And that wouldn't be acceptable. And so the point I want to make in all this is that's still happening yet today in the world. In various countries throughout the world, we're sort of maybe a little naive and we've been protected by the grace of God to that type of persecution. But in many, many nations in the world today, the established religion of their na nation uh, persecutes Christians, people that believe in the Bible, using that term that way, people that believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God or something to that effect. And so people are dying all over the world today, just like in that day. And it is my opinion that even in this country, it's going to start to come pretty close to that. It's already started. And uh, they're trying to control speech so that if I were to preach some of the things the Bible says, it will be recognized as hate speech and it won't be acceptable. And that I believe that before, and this is just opinion, so it's not scriptural, but I believe before the church is raptured out of here, the professing church will turn against the body of Christ. And they will be saying, yeah, that's just a bunch of fanatics. Well, you know something? We are fanatics about the truth, the word of God. And that present day professing church is just like what I think Islam is today. Those who they call radical and fundamentalists and everything in Islam are those that are really adhering to what the Quran says. That if the heathen does not repent and turn to Islam and turn to Allah, we have to train him. And then if he won't be trained, we have to discipline him. And if he won't be disciplined, we have to kill him. And so it's the same way in their religion. And it's amazing if you study a lot of these things that it's very apparent throughout history that that's been the case. God has not been the true God of the majority for any sustained length of time in history of the human race. And that's just the way it is. And so uh, with this type of persecution, and now it comes down to what we believe. What we believe called the gospel of the grace of God. Most people don't have any problem with that at all. Because grace is very prominent today in talking about grace. But when you start to articulate and define the distinctiveness of that gospel of the grace of God is in the Bible. In what is called the mystery. I can guarantee you if you talk to people who profess to be believers in Jesus Christ and you ask them about well do you does your church preach Jesus Christ they'd say oh yes yes for sure but if you say does your church preach Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery and their mouth will just go what are you talking about and so for those of us that believe what we believe even within the church, the body of Christ, we are labeled heretics, or we're in a cult, or Satan has captured us. I've been told all those things. They'll pray for us. Fortunately, the laws protect us a little bit at this point, but I'm of the opinion one day that may all change. And so Paul, when he was doing what he was doing, was just doing what comes naturally to a religious person. They really believe that they're serving God with every fiber of their body and they're doing what is right. And that's a way that the doctrine of uh, Pauline theology, um, they, I know that they speak to their congregations and things uh, and put down what we believe. 
but I'm here to tell you today that uh, I can't, I don't ever foresee myself being in this con position, but I would not sacrifice the truth of the mystery for anything. It, yeah, I just wouldn't do it. I just don't believe it. There's, that is the truth for today. And we don't have to fight to defend it or anything else. We just trust it. And so Paul is going on here now to talk about this again in Galatians 1.14. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. Paul now realizes that he's had this radical <clears throat> revelation given to him, that his life in Judaism was driven by pride of life and the lust of the flesh. Even though it was in the religious realm, it was not of God, it was all of the world. It was Paul's ignorant religious zeal that motivated him to do whatever he could to eradicate this perceived threat to Judaism. In spite of his rebellious and attitude against the very God he thought he was serving, the God of all grace had chosen Paul, had predestined Paul, for his own special, glorious purpose. Even when Paul was fighting against it all, God had a plan for his life. And so in 1 Timothy 1.13, Paul describes that. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. Paul even describes himself as a violent man, but I'll bet you when he was doing it, he didn't perceive himself to be that. He was being a faithful soldier. He was being a defender of the faith. And so that justified his violence in those days. But he now sees it in a different light. And so I submit to you that today there remains again a great deal of ignorance and unbelief concerning Paul's gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the mystery. What a great loss they will realize when God judges the world according to Paul's gospel. And that's what Paul says in Romans chapter 2 and verse 16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. And so I want to encourage you today that before your radical change, whatever your situation was, you were in rebellion against God. Before you came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ before you understood that your sin had separated you from God and that Jesus Christ was your only hope. No matter how religious you were, no matter how faithful you were to that perceived religion, you were dead in trespasses and sins and you were at enmity to God. And then the Spirit of God illumined your heart enlightened your mind to the truth of the gospel and you believe and that's when the radical change began in you and I pray that you will continue to grow in your radicalization or whatever it is that you will just be amazed with the radical grace of God in this message that he has forgiven us all of our trespasses. I can guarantee you that the vast majority of churches today that don't really preach Paul's gospel are preaching a mixture of legalism and grace. And that admixture causes within the hearers a great sense of guiltiness, 
a great sense of failure, a great sense of uh, inferiority, and as we've talked about, that's all past for all of us. We were all of that. We're not that anymore in Christ. In Christ, we've been raised up and seated with him in the heavenly realms. We're in Christ, we're waiting for his appearance, looking forward to that glorious, blessed day when we'll all be gathered together to be with him forever. And God is not ever seeing you again as the sinner you are. He's seeing you as holy and without blame before him in love. And that's his desire for each of our lives, that we would conduct our lives in that way. Without blame, even though you will be blamed, in God's sight, there is no blame. He has justified you. He has declared you, accounted you righteous in his sight because of the righteousness of Christ that's put on your account. That's the gospel of the grace of God. And so I pray that every morning when you wake up and every night when you lie down to go to sleep, you can relax and rest in this marvelous gospel of God's grace. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we bow before you overwhelmed with your goodness and kindness to us. Being Gentiles in the flesh, we had no claim on you, but you had a claim on us from before the creation of the world. You had already laid out your plan, and you had chosen your greatest persecutor in the body or in the kingdom church, the apostle Paul, who at that time was Saul, a devout religious man, thinking he was doing your duty, your work, was actually 180 degrees away from that. Lord, we too were in that same position, but now in Christ we've been brought near by his blood. We've been saved, sealed, and secured for all eternity in Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. And our final